Family mode. Hello, everyone, and thanks for joining us. I'm Sean Esterly with the National Renewable Energy Laboratory, and I just want to welcome you to today's webinar, which is being hosted by the Clean Energy Solutions Center in partnership with the Bloomberg New Energy Finance and USAID. And today's webinar will be focused on the Climate Scope 2014 report. And one important note of mention before we begin our presentations is that the Clean Energy Solutions Center does not endorse or recommend specific products or services. Information provided in this webinar is featured in the Solutions Center's resource library as one of many best practices, resources reviewed and selected by technical experts. And before we begin, I just want to go over some of the webinar features. You do have two options for audio. You may either listen through your computer or over your telephone. If you do choose to listen through your computer, please select the mic and speakers option in the audio pane. Doing that will just help eliminate the possibility of feedback and echo. And if you choose to dial in by phone, please select the telephone option. And then a box on the right side will display the telephone number and audio pin that you can use to dial in. And panelists, just a reminder, we um, ask that you please mute your audio device while you are not presenting. And if anyone is having technical difficulties with the webinar, you may contact the GoToWebinars help desk at the number displayed at the bottom of the slide. That number is 888-259-3826. And we encourage anyone from the audience to ask questions at any point throughout the uh, webinar. And to do that, simply type your question into the question pane and submit it through there. And if you're having difficulty viewing the materials through the webinar portal, you will find PDF copies of the presentations at cleanenergysolutions.org forward slash training. And you may follow along as the, the speakers present. Also, we'll be posting an audio recording of the presentations to the Solution Center training page within about a week of today's broadcast. And we are also adding recordings to the Solution Center YouTube channel where you'll find other informative webinars as well as video interviews with thought leaders on clean energy policy topics. So today's agenda is centered around the presentations from our guest panelists, Maria Hilda Rivera and Nico Chiabji. And these panelists have been kind enough to discuss the Climate Scope 2014 report. And results of the report suggest that renewable technologies can be just as cost competitive in emerging parts of the world as they are in richer nations. And in this webinar, panelists will review the study's key highlights and some of its surprising findings. Now, this slide provides a bit of background in terms of how the Solution, Solution Center came to be formed. The Solution Center is one of 13 initiatives of the Clean Energy Ministerial that was launched in April of 2011 and is primarily led by Australia, the United States, and other CEM partners. Some outcomes of this unique initiative include support of developing countries and emerging economies through enhancement of resources on policies relating to energy access, no-cost expert policy assistance, and peer-to-peer -peer learning and training tools, such as the webinar that you're attending today. And there's four primary goals for the Solution Center. First goal is to serve as a clearinghouse of clean energy policy resources. Second is to share policy best practices, data, and analysis tools specific to clean energy policies and programs. Third is to deliver dynamic services that enable expert assistance, learning, and peer-to-peer -peer sharing of experiences. And then lastly, the center fosters dialogue on emerging policy issues and innovation around the globe. And our primary audience is energy policymakers and analysts from governments and technical organizations in all countries. But then we also strive to engage with the private sector, NGOs, and civil society. And one of the marquee features that the Solution Center provides is its no-cost expert policy assistance, known as Ask an Expert. And the Ask an Expert uh, program has established a broad team of over 30 experts from around the globe who are available to provide remote policy advice and analysis to all countries at no cost. So for example, in the area of climate finance and emission trading, we're very pleased to have Barbara Buckner, Director of the Climate Policy Initiative for Europe, serving as one of our experts. So if you have a need for policy assistance in climate finance and emission trading or any other clean energy sector, we do encourage you to use this valuable service. And again, it's provided to you free of charge. So to find out if the Ask an Expert service can benefit your work, please contact me directly at sean.esterly at nrel.gov or at my work number, 303-384-7436. Or you can also go to the Clean Energy Solutions Center website and uh, submit your question through there. 
And we also invite you to spread the word about this service to those in your network and organizations. And so now I'd like to provide brief introductions for today's panelists. Uh, first up today will be Maria Hilda Rivera, who is Energy Advisor for USAID and Power Africa. And Maria will be introducing the Climate Scope Project. And then following Maria, we will hear from Nico Tiaji. And Nico is an associate at Bloomberg New Energy Finance, where he coordinates research on Africa for the Global Climate Scope Project. And so with that, I'd now like to welcome Maria to the webinar. Thanks, Sean, and thanks so much um, for everyone participating today. We're very grateful for the opportunity to present um, the Climate Scope findings of the Clean Energy Solutions Center. Um, so what is, um, so as Sean mentioned, I am P Power Africa Energy Advisor. Um, which Power Africa is a whole of government effort um, to increase access and generation in Sub-Saharan Africa. Um, this year, um, Power Africa joined the Inter-American Development Bank and the UK Department for International Development and its support to Bloomberg New Energy Finance um, to expand the scope of, of climate scope. Um, so what is climate scope? Hi, Maria, just to interject real quick, um, we can't see, can you pull up your slides? We're just seeing the GoToWebinar screen on here. I can't see them. That's it's actually, it's actually Nico working on that. Nico, would you like me to run your deck? Yes, you must be. I, I can't seem to find okay. on the webinar page. Excellent. I can do that. One moment, please, Maria. Sorry about that. Thanks. Yeah. Okay, there we go. Okay, next slide, please. The following one. Thanks. Um, so what is Climate Scope, this effort that we've um, been supporting? Um, first, I'd like to stress that it's a free tool um, available to all online. It's an initiative to provide timely, accurate, and actionable data that informs smart investments um, in policy making. Um, with the ultimate goal to mobilize capital for clean energy in emerging markets. Climate Scope serves as an index to measure relative conditions for clean energy development in various nations with a scoring system that goes from zero to five. It's a report that provides detailed descriptions of policy frameworks, financial resources, and markets in developing countries. And it also serves as an interactive online tool that allows users to examine the relevant data in greater depth through a graphical interface. Um, Climate Scope of Works is an open source data resource for NGOs, um, multilateral development banks, um, and other institutions working in the low carbon energy development and energy access fields um, that they can down use for downloading data for their research and work. The next slide show gives you a little bit of the inter user interface. Next one. Yeah. Um, of the interface for climate scope. It's a, it's, it's a wealth of information that we hope different stakeholders in the clean energy space can make use of. Now I'll introduce you. I'd like to hand it over to my colleague Nico from Bloomberg New Energy Finance who will walk you through some of the findings for this year's climate scope. Thank you very much, Maria Hilda, um, and thank you very much to the Clean Energy Solutions Center. Um, it's great to be able to share climate scope. Um, I'm Nico Tayabji. I'm an associate at Bloomberg New Energy Finance uh, based in London, um, and I've been closely involved with particularly the Africa side of the research for climate scope. Now, climate scope also covers um, many countries in Asia and Latin America. So this has really been a year-long um, research process for, for us um, with our colleagues uh, based around the world in Cape Town, in Sao Paulo, um, in Hong Kong, Beijing, all very closely involved in this process. Um, and I'd like to take the opportunity to thank our, our supporters um, at, at Power Africa and also um, the UK Department for International Development and the Inter-American Development Bank for their support. Um, I'm going to do three things really. Firstly, talk a bit more about what Climate Scope is and what we hope it's useful for um, and how we went about it. Um, and then I'm going to sort of look at some of the insights that we've, we've drawn from this, this research. Um, and then I'm also going to go into more of a focus on Africa um, and sort of some of the 
um, conclusions and insights we're, we're drawing from climate scope related to the African countries. Um, so the next slide, please. So to, to start out kind of top level, um, I guess this is what climate scope is um, ultimately. Um, it's, it's an index um, and a ranking of 55 countries. Um, and the index, um, the, the score that's given to them, is really an assessment of the conditions within that country um, for the scale up of clean energy investment. Um, so just maybe to start out kind of high level results, um, seeing what countries are in the top 10. Um, we have China and Brazil um, up there. I suppose that's not really a surprise. Um, and what, what we've been watching at Bloomberg New Energy Finance over the last five years is the emergence of those two countries as uh, you know, global leaders. And, and China in particular, um, for a number of years, has been installing more renewable energy capacity than anybody else and investing more money into it. Um, maybe some of the kind of bigger surprises would be um, the presence of three sub-Saharan African countries in the top ten. So South Africa at number three. Again, maybe less surprising than the presence of Kenya and Uganda um, a, bit, a bit further down in the top ten. Likewise, Uruguay was, was quite an interesting um, development this year. Um, that's a, a high finish and based on a kind of new rush of investment over the last year or two. And then if we look at the sort of bottom 10, um, we can see that we're, we're dealing with countries with very different um, conditions and environments. And what we try and do in Climate Scope is, is capture those different conditions um, in a way where they're still comparable between very different countries, whether it's Venezuela with 30 million people or Suriname with half a million people. So Climate Scope is a tool that allows us to compare these countries, and it presents a huge amount of the data that goes into these scores online, makes it freely available. Uh, next slide, please. So this year, uh, we've looked at the, the following nations, 26 in Latin American Caribbean, um, that, that's the entire region. And the 2014 edition of Climate Scope builds on um, two previous editions in 2012 and 2013, um, which was exclusively looking at those nations. So in Climate Scope 2014, uh, we've been able to expand to 19 sub-Saharan African nations and 35 Asian nations, states, and provinces. So that 35 includes 15 Chinese provinces and 10 Indian states. Next slide, please. If we look at how we actually built Climate Scope and, and what is the data that goes into, into this, um, it's really across four different platforms. Um, firstly, the enabling framework. Secondly, clean energy investment. Then low carbon business and value chains. And finally, on the greenhouse gas management activities and, and carbon market activities. And this covers around 195 sub-indicators, but um, those are made up of, of more, than, more than that in, in terms of individual data points. Um, so essentially what ClimateScope does is, is gather all of those different data points um, and produce a, a, a ranking. Um, next slide, please. Those four parameters provide a, a weighting, and we, um, we, we, we make that weighting interactive. So uh, for, for users who have different interests, um, you can go to the website, um, and actually if you, if you could go to the next slide, um, this just shows uh, if, if we are to, uh, say, increase the weighting of the clean energy investment parameter, um, you can see the results change somewhat. So the idea here is really that um, different users will, will have different interests. Um, for instance, you may be more interested in the enabling framework if you're interested in seeing what kind of policy regimes um, have brought about investment. Um, or likewise, um, if you're looking more at the investment itself, um, you get the Uruguay kind of rushing to the top. Um, and I'll, I'll explain more about why, why that would be um, as, as we go forward. So next slide, please. So, so these uh, four uh, parameters, 
the enabling framework, um, our kind of default weighting, uh, it, it gets the most, the most weight. It's around 40% of the overall score. And that comprises um, policy and regulation, so specific incentives for clean energy development, but also the kind of wider structure of the power market. Um, and that's really about looking at the extent of liberalization and the extent of private uh, participation in those markets already. We also look at clean energy penetration, um, so the level of capacity um, that's already made up of clean energy. I should point out that our definitions um, over these climate scopes have not included large hydro. That's hard hydro above 50 megawatts um, within the kind of clean energy bracket. Um, and that's really for, for a couple of different reasons. I mean, one is over, a concern over the environmental effects. Um, the other was uh, when we at Bloomberg New Energy Finance started tracking these markets, um, large hydro was very much an established technology, whereas we were tracking the emergence of the new technologies in, say, solar and wind and biofuels and biomass. Uh, part of the enabling framework is also around price attractiveness. So power prices, and, and our general approach is that um, high power price market um, signifies uh, high demand, um, and therefore a market that investors might be um, looking to enter into. And likewise, the, the expectations for market size, we look at indicators such as um, power demand and the growth of power demand. The second parameter um, the clean energy investment really builds on uh, Bloomberg New Energy Finance's uh, data on the projects that are being built around the world and the funds that are flowing into those projects. So this, for us as a research house, this is our kind of daily bread. Um, we have a large team of people who are, who are tracking all of these individual projects. Um, likewise, where, where that investment is coming from, so the different kind of, kinds of investors. Um, whether that investment is being sourced locally or is flowing in from overseas. Um, part of the financing, we also look at the, um, the financing condition. Um, this includes microfinance, um, but also several indicators on the cost of debt. Then on the third parameter, uh, low carbon business and value chain, what we're really doing here is looking at who's already present in the countries, um, who is, is poised to be part of um, investment in clean energy. So this is both equipment manufacturers across the different renewable energy sectors, um, but also, uh, but, but also the service providers and financial institutions involved in those sectors. And then finally, on the carbon side, we look at the historical um, level of offsetting. Um, through both the carbon markets, but also the voluntary markets. Um, we also look at the potential for further offsets, and we look at the policy in place within the countries um, towards emissions reduction. And finally, we look at several indicators based on the engagements of, of cor the corporate sector, um, different companies in cutting their own emissions. And the default weightings for these parameters are 40% attributed to the enabling framework 30% towards the investment indicators, and then 15% each on the value chains and the carbon-related indicators. And as I said, those are weightings that the user is able to, to play with and adjust to their own interests. Next slide, please. So one of the adaptations that we've made um, for the 2014 edition of Climate Scope um, in order to expand to cover the African and Asian countries was to include uh, off-grid and distributed energy. And to do so, we, we added several indicators, um, which I've highlighted here in the italics. So for instance, within the price attractiveness, we are not just looking at power prices now. We're also looking at diesel prices and kerosene prices. So those fuels um, that within countries with lower levels of uh, electrification um, these fuels may indeed be sort of important indicators of um, the, the incumbent generation that would need to be displaced, and even at the, the very micro scale. So thinking of um, the potential for the investment in, in solar, distributed solar, displacing kerosene as, as a lighting fuel. 
Um, likewise, for the market size expectation, um, we included the electrification rate. And then we added uh, two completely new indicators to the enabling framework parameter. Um, one around the regulatory framework for distributed energy. So this really being the, uh, the, the, the policies in place the, and, and the regulations in place around being able to build mini grids and small power projects. Um, and likewise, we, we looked further at the energy access policies in place. On the investment side, we expanded our coverage of grants. Um, so we had a lower threshold for the grants that we included in the investment levels within the country. And then we also, on the third parameter, um, with value chains, we, uh, we included sectors specific to um, sort of mini grids and, and distributed energy. We, we wanted um, to include further indicators for um, the level of clean energy penetration as far as it related to the off-grid sectors. So for instance, um, to what extent are we seeing the distribution of, say, solar home systems? Um, we, we set out to do that. Um, this was one of the, the real um, challenges that we found in Climate Scope 2014, in that there is currently uh, not very good data on those sectors specifically. Um, so in, in a way, I think we um, sort of redoubled our efforts on the regulatory side, um, but the, the, the being able to, to measure the, um, the actual uh, distribution of these products um, and also looking on sort of uh, kilowatt, megawatt terms is something that we are very interested in coming back to um, and we're sort of in active discussion with various partners over how to do this. But then if we look a little more in depth on the next slide, please, um, at, the, at the regulations that we did look at um, relating to mini-grids and, and the off-grid sectors. Um, on the distributed energy regulatory frameworks, um, this was very much about uh, both the, the ability for investors in these sectors to re recover their investments, um, but also What's, uh, what's put in place, the, the frameworks put in place by governments. Um, so for instance, whether standardized power purchase agreements are available, um, where, whether they're long enough to, uh, to, to be bankable, um, and whether there are clear rules, say, on the interconnection of, of different projects and uh, different grids. On the energy access policies, um, we looked at the presence of rural electrification programs, um, whether there's de dedicated agencies and the targets and plans around that. And I should, um, I, I wanted to particularly point out a, an excellent report that um, we found helpful and, and spoke with the authors of the report by the World Bank titled From the Bottom Up, um, which is a very, um, a very good toolkit towards looking at particularly the regulatory environment for mini grids. Okay, next slide, please. So I hope I've now given you a sense of, of what went into Climate Scope. And now let's take a look at what we sort of found um, from that. And I'm going to start by looking at um, some of the global insights, um, but also then look more regionally as well. So at a very high level, uh, what we found was the growth rates within the Climate Scope countries um, hugely outstripping the, uh, the OECD countries. And I think um, this is particularly interesting because renewable energy has, has often been seen as something of a, a rich country's game. Um, so we all hear the stories about how um, Europe and, and the US is building huge amounts of capacity. Um, but when we're sort of thinking about the, the, the options for developing countries, maybe um, we're sort of less thinking about clean energy. So, so what we found in pure sort of quantity terms um, is that the climate scope countries between 2008 and 2013 added 600 gigawatts of, of overall capacity. Sorry, this is, this is to start out with looking at the total installed power capacity. Um, so firstly, a mark of the, the demand for new capacity um, in the climate scope countries, um, adding 600 gigawatts 
to reach just over two terawatts, so a growth rate of a third in, in total capacity installed. Um, of course, China accounts for a very large amount of it, so 416 gigawatts of that um, was China, and China had a growth rate of its own capacity of over 50%. Now, a, a rather extraordinary kind of um, barometer of, of how much that is is that in 2012, China installed, I think, around 80 gigawatts of, of power capacity in total, which is the same as, uh, as Mexico's entire power sector capacity, uh, Mexico, of course, being 120 million people or so. Over the same period, um, the OECD countries, conversely, um, added 260 gigawatts, um, which was a growth rate of around 10%. So we're looking at um, total growth rate um, in that period for, total, uh, for, for all power capacity of 10% in the OECD countries versus 50% for, um, for China and a third for climate scope countries. So next slide, please. And here we're looking specifically at clean energy and um, non-large hydro clean energy. The picture is a little bit different if we include large hydro. Um, but, but without it, we again see tremendous growth. And you can really see that the growth has been in both the climate scope countries and the OECD countries. Um, the growth rate in that period for climate scope countries was 143%. For OECD countries, 84%. And in that time, climate scope countries added 140 gigawatts versus the OECD's 213 gigawatts. Now, interestingly, um, the, the clean energy capacity made up around a quarter of the capacity additions, total capacity additions, in the climate scope countries. Whereas in the OECD countries, it, the, the clean energy was 80% of total capacity. So I think we can really see different stories going on there. Um, OECD, you know, generally an established power sector base, um, upon which for particularly environmental concerns, um, there, there's a, there's a, a, a new uh, incentive to, to add clean energy capacity. Whereas maybe in the climate scope countries, we're more talking about um, a, a general demand um, for new capacity, of which clean energy um, is part. Now, one of the interesting things is that over those six years, we've seen an increase in the ratio of clean energy capacity to non-clean energy capacity additions for the climate scope countries. So for instance, in 2013, um, the climate scope countries added 37 gigawatts of renewable capacity, and the OECD countries added 43 gigawatts. Next slide, please. So how do we account for these uh, rather dramatic um, upticks in, in the level of capacity being stored in the clean energy sectors? Well. Largely, it's to do with cost. Um, one of the things that we at BNF, the Bloomberg New Energy Finance, do is track um, the evolution of the levelized cost of electricity across the clean energy sectors. Um, so the, just to explain briefly, um, levelized cost is uh, it's a dollar per megawatt hour um, amount. And actually, I think this chart is, is missing the unit. Sorry for that. So this, all these figures are in dollars per megawatt hour. And it's essentially an all-in cost of generating unit of power. Um, that's across a, a capex, opex, um, and then looking at the, the, the resource or, or performance um, for the renew renewable resources, um, as well as financing indicators. Importantly, this does not include subsidies, and it does not include carbon costs. Um, so if you like, this is as trying to be as pure as possible in, in comparing the cost of generation between technologies. Um, I think the, the, the major story over the last five years has been uh, the way that the cost of, of solar has come down. So that's been a, a reduction of over 70%. Now what, what you see in this chart is the white circles are our most recent levelized cost figures, um, central scenario, um, which includes quite Western European conditions. Um, so not particularly high capacity factors, but pretty good financing conditions. Um, the, the blue diamonds show the um, regional scenarios. So again, the variance is based on resources and financing conditions as well as the cost of the technologies themselves. Um, and if you see at the bottom um, 
those are reference scenarios for uh, fossil fuel and, and nuclear generation. Um, and we're really pushing up with with uh, with solar and wind in particular, onshore wind in particular, um, in the cost competitiveness, competitiveness without subsidy. Um, and if if we could go to the next slide, please. One of the things we've we've done through ClimateScope is collect um, industrial, uh, residential, commercial, and, and average uh, power prices. So this is putting our kind of global central scenario, solar and onshore wind levelized costs against industrial power prices. Um, and we can see that already um, in many parts of the world, uh, it's, it's already cheaper to, to generate and to try and purchase your, your unit of power um, from renewable sources. Now, of course, um, to, to, to kind of uh, to, to, to give a nuance to what this means, um, this does not include system costs. So that's a, that's a different question, really. Um, how you have a functioning and, and balanced uh, power system. But I, I guess the the main point um, is that the the changes in the cost of, of renewable technologies is a very important dynamic occurring not just in, um, in, in, in emerging markets but around the world. And we're already seeing the, the effects of uh, that presenting new challenges to existing business models for utilities and, and also for the way that power sectors are structured. Um, some of the, the reforms that are going on in Europe at the moment are very much around um, how to deal with the changing profile of, of uh, a liberalized power market. Um, we could also show a very similar chart um, for residential power prices. So this being an even simpler kind of question, I guess, um, which is for, for you as a residential consumer, does it make sense for you to put solar panels on your roof or not? And uh, increasingly around the world, um, the answer is yes, even without subsidy. Um, I think now in Italy um, that, uh, that those figures kind of make sense. Um, essentially, if you've got $10,000 to spare, um, it's, a, it's a wise bet to, to put solar panels on your roof. So next slide, please. So that's really just to, to dip into the changing cost profiles. But of course, policy is um, it's still fundamental. Um, while the economics are improving, um, the power sector is highly regulated. Um, and even where it's uh, liberalized power markets, they're still very much dependent on um, the way that regulations are shaped. So one of the things we've done through ClimateScope is, is collect um, a huge number of, of individual policies which are available on the ClimateScope website in a policy library. Um, we've tracked almost 360 policies in the ClimateScope countries um, since 2006, and about 60% of them introduced since 2011. Most of these are energy market policies, so they include feed and tariffs, uh, auctions. We also include, say, renewable energy targets within energy market policies. Uh, details of all of those policies are available on the ClimateScope website. Next slide, please. And when we think about um, the, the relevance of, of policy, um, this is some data we pulled together from the ClimateScope results. Um, on the y-axis, that's the policy score that was attributed to the country. Now, I should explain that uh, within our, our methodology, the way that countries um, were awarded score for their policy environments was actually done through an external panel of experts. Um, so we had around 50 people, um, experts around the world, um, who were involved in assessing and rating um, the policies on, on a set uh, bunch of parameters. Um, so that the scores on the y-axis, on the x-axis, uh, we've got investment levelized against GDP. I should also explain that for these kind of indicators in climate scope, um, we, we levelize against the country size. So for instance, uh, obviously China it has invested far more in clean energy than anyone else in the world. Um, and so we'd be off the chart here. So by uh, relativizing it, um, levelizing that amount to the country's GDP, um, we have, we're able to kind of compare countries more easily. 
So you, you can see there's a, a few outliers based on that approach. Um, Sierra Leone, for instance, have had really only one uh, clean energy financing um, of the ADAX bioenergy plant, um, and that sort of registers very significantly, even though uh, the country really has no renewable energy uh, policy to speak of, um, and hence scores, uh, in fact, zero uh, for the policy score. But in general, the trend is um, the, the, the higher the policy score, um, the more the, the investment. Um, and then we can see, you know, very clearly, say, a country like Kenya, uh, which was really the early mover in Africa uh, in terms of establishing feed and tariffs and attracting investments as well. Okay, next slide, please. So I wanted to look at a couple of the big trends that we've, we've seen in climate scope, um, and starting by looking at the different parameters. Um, so to begin with, uh, just a reminder, the parameters being the first enabling framework, the second clean energy investment, the third around um, the value chains and presence of businesses within the country, and the fourth on, on carbon. Uh, next slide, please. So if we only look at the parameter one scores, in other words, how the countries do on their enabling frameworks, um, we have Brazil uh, finishing at the top. And that's very much around the, 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 the specific incentives and, and the auctions that the country's been running for several years. In fact, in its latest auction, um, Brazil's first uh, that had a carve out for solar, um, it's been able to deliver the, the lowest um, solar uh, contract that we've seen so far um, at around $87 per megawatt hour. That was just last week the results were announced. Um, another important side in Brazil is the um, financing that's uh, made available, the soft financing by the National Development Bank, the NDEF. Um, another side of the enabling framework then in terms of price attractiveness is that Brazil has had very high power prices. Um, partly related to, to drought problems. And then I think, uh, you know, maybe the slightly startling result here is Rwanda uh, finishing at number two on parameter one above China. Um, so Rwanda beat China. Um, now this is, uh, this is an interesting case where the levelization really kicks in uh, because Rwanda has um, a range of policies but really not particularly ambitious ones. So. For instance, an auction recently for um, a pretty small amount of, of solar capacity. Um, and likewise, sort of specific policies in place for the development of, of small hydro and distributed small hydro. But, but where it's scoring very highly is the relative level of the clean energy capacity um, compared to its overall capacity. Um, so so RAN has kind of been thrust up there. It also scored well um, when it came to the energy access policy. Um, and the country has a pretty significant electrification program, um, though by no means only related to off-grid. Um, in fact, uh, a lot to do with on-grid electrification as well. Um, China finished high as well. Um, Kenya and Dominican Republic also uh, perhaps sort of more surprising um, to, to be in fourth and fifth respectively. Um, but again, sort of significant policies in place. Uh, next slide, please. On the clean energy investment front, um, sorry, the one just before that. Uh, so we, we would have Uruguay finishing first when it just comes to clean energy investment. Um, so it, the investment it secured in 2013 amounted extraordinarily to 2.5% of GDP. Um, that's very much about a, 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 um, a country-level decision to, to increase the, the level of clean energy. Uh, so Uruguay has held auctions um, and will see its, its capacity build out over the coming years as well. South Africa uh, has attracted $10.5 billion since 2006. That's very much related to a, a recent auction program. Um, we've really seen that financing flowing in over the last two years. Um, interestingly, uh, that $10.5 billion is not so significant relative to its uh, economy size. 
um, and actually where it scored particularly well on the investment parameter uh, was in the, the local investments. So there's been a, a very high involvement of South African banks um, and, and other funds uh, in, in seeing those projects come to fruition and being very engaged in the auction process. Um, Nicaragua again uh, finishing, finishing highly. In fact, Nicaragua finished uh, second and third in the Latin America only climate scope um, over the past couple of years. Um, so while it's, uh, it may be surprising to see Nicaragua up there again this year, um, I, I guess it's less surprising to us and, and for, for those that have seen um, the prior editions of climate scope. Next slide, please. So on the, the presence of low carbon business, um, I guess it's, it's pretty unsurprising that you find China, Brazil, and India in the top five. Um, of course, you know, giant economies um, really covering most of the, um, the different clean energy sectors and service providers with companies uh, based within those countries. Um, and, and China scored a perfect five here. I mean, the, you can find um, anyone that you need to engage in clean energy in China. Um, not much of a surprise. I think South Africa is a very interesting story here. Um, South Africa, as I said, has really seen investment um, just over the last two years. But one of the important aspects of the, um, the auction program run right over the past two years are local content rules. Um, so, th so that's really seen um, the establishment or, or the beginnings of an establishment of a manufacturing base um, through, through government policy. Pakistan um, at number four. Again, though, it's, it's, a, it's a large country, um, but perhaps a little surprising to be in the top five. Um, and actually, Pakistan is credited with having um, many players involved in the off-grid uh, off sector. Next slide, please. So when it comes to carbon, um, the outstanding performer was Chile. Um, and that's not just about the presence of offset projects. Uh, it also has South America's first carbon tax. In, in China, there's been very significant activities. So while China is the world's largest emitter, um, it also has significant activities uh, to both measure, record, and, um, and to, to reduce emissions. Um, otherwise, in the top five, uh, all from Latin America, and I think it's quite noticeable that the African countries did not perform very well on the carbon indicators. Um, I think that's a measure of the lower level of CDM and other carbon market related activities. But it's also a measure of the, um, the, 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 the status of, of carbon policy, if you like. Um, so really, the only, only country engaging um, significantly on, on carbon policy and sort of specific measures around um, cutting emissions. Uh, South Africa, um, which has a proposed carbon tax, um, but it's, it's very much uh, uh, not implemented yet, and uh, we'll have to see whether that indeed comes in in the coming years, given that South Africa's generation profile is largely coal-based, uh, and given the financial difficulties of the state-owned utility. Next slide, please. So just to, just to run through uh, what the regional indexes look like. Uh, next slide, please. So Asia, we, we had a, a lower number of Asian countries. Um, so it's a smaller index. Um, we have China and India in the top two positions. In fact, um, on the website and in the report, both of these countries uh, can be expanded so that you can see uh, the performance of individual provinces and states. So there are also uh, province and state rankings. Um, for, for the Asian countries, um, we had four that we classified as off-grid, so that were assessed on the basis of the off-grid parameters that I previously introduced. Um, they included Pakistan, uh, Nepal, Bangladesh, and Myanmar. Uh, if we could just move to the next slide, please. So for Latin America and the Caribbean, uh, Brazil, the, the clear um, top runner, 
um, followed by Chile, which has also been a strong finisher for the past couple of years. Uruguay really um, moving up several places since the previous years of assessment. Um, and then at the other end of the scale, um, say Venezuela and Suriname not performing well. Um, Venezuela in particular uh, is, is a country where um, the, the power sector is, is, not, uh, is not attractive to, to outside investment and hasn't really seen any. Um, if we could have the next slide, please. So I, I really wanted to focus now on uh, the African countries which I've been most closely involved in. Um, and this is the picture of the, the Africa Index. Um, so South Africa at the top, is, as you have heard already, followed by Kenya and Uganda with two very strong finishes. Um, both Kenya and Uganda performed well, not just for uh, the, the policy frameworks, um, though both have, uh, have scored well in, in that. Both actually scored well on value chains. Um, so what we found was that there are, there are already many companies in, in both those countries um, working in these sectors um, and also service providers. Ethiopia, I think, is a very interesting case because um, it, it didn't score well on policy or for the power sector structure. So it's very much a, a state-controlled economy, really, um, but one that has nonetheless been able to attract um, some investment in clean energy. And that's really more through government procurement and particularly um, foreign direct investment by, um, by China. So uh, soft Chinese loans and uh, projects that have been constructed um, very much uh, in partnership with, with China. Um, however, Ethiopia, I think, is, is a country to keep an eye on because there are, there are very ambitious targets and there are also starting to be the first signs of um, of private investment. So the government has signed its first agreements with um, independent power producers. Tanzania um, at number five scored very well for the distributed, uh, distributed energy policies. And we'll, we'll look a bit more in detail at that shortly. An interesting one to, to look at is, is Liberia. Um, because Liberia is a country um, that has, I, I mean, has particular challenges, of course, um, and, and very much uh, alongside Sierra Leone, um, relatively recent post-conflict countries, very low levels of energy access. Um, and I think it's interesting that Liberia uh, sort of finishes a bit mid-table, really, um, and that's down to a couple of things. Um, in particular, it's around the very high power prices. Uh, very low electrification rates, and also very low proportion of people with access to clean cooking, which was another indicator that we included. Um, and this meant that it, it scores in those areas. Um, I guess the, the idea being that, that those are all indicators of suppressed demand um, and people paying too much already. Um, so, so that's a country where um, I think ClimateScape demonstrates the kind of conditions that might be there for, um, say, particular off-grid or distributed energy um, options. If you could have the next slide, please. And, and the next one again. So I now wanted to pull out a little bit of the information um, that is all available through the website and the ClimateScope report. Um, and I hope sort of lends some insight to, um, to what's going on uh, in the African countries. So I guess to start kind of uh, a little high level, um, this is the overall power, uh, power capacity for the 19 sub-Saharan African countries, um, spanning us around 77 gigawatts. Um, to give you a comparison, the UK has around 90, a bit more than 90 gigawatts. Um, of that 77 gigawatts, um, well over half is down to South Africa. And then if we extrapolate and look just at the clean energy capacity, um, we're looking at about 2.1 gigawatts in 2013. Um, that, will, that will increase this year um, somewhat. Um, we forecast for the whole of sub-Saharan Africa 
um, a bit over five gigawatts of clean energy capacity. Again, bear in mind that's excluding large hydro. Um, but that's uh, that 2.1 gigawatts for the climate scope countries. Um, that's about what the UK has installed of just solar just in 2013. Uh, that's a slightly unfair comparison because the UK um, weirdly has been the, the biggest solar market in Europe. Um, but to give you an idea of, of, of the amount of stuff we're talking about. Um, and in fact, the UK um, has, has, by the end of this year, will have roughly the same amount of solar as um, the whole of sub-Saharan Africa has clean energy, excluding large hydro. Next slide, please. So we collected a lot of data on electricity prices. And in this chart, uh, we've, we've um, cascaded African countries by power price, um, and then also shown the power mix. Uh, so the, the, the slightly uh, paler blue um, that you can see particularly on the countries lower down um, is large hydro. And, and we see that those countries with the lowest electricity prices um, really being those that have predominantly large hydro-based power sectors. Um, those more reliant on fossil fuels tend to be those with higher power prices. And you can see Liberia um, with its power average average power price of $534 per megawatt hour. Um, that's probably, probably the highest in the world. Um, it's certainly up there in the top two or three. Um, you can also see in the middle of this, uh, those countries that are more, uh, that, that have seen uh, the growth of gas capacity. So countries like Nigeria, Ghana, Cote d'Ivoire. Um, so they're sort of more middling. Um, there are also countries that, that slightly buck the idea of, um, of, a, of a kind of old fossil fuels, gas, and then hydro um, ranking of power prices. So South Africa, um, I, in, in a way, South Africa is just a completely different environment because it's got so much more capacity than any of these other countries, and more than all of them combined. Um, but that $76 per megawatt hour um, is a very much a politically suppressed power price and one that's causing ESCOM, the utility, um, many financial difficulties. Uh, if we could go to the next slide, please. So where does clean energy investment fit into this for Africa? Um, so this is what we've seen in the, cli the 19 climate scope African countries um, since 2008. And you can really see the, the two dark green bars there in 2012 and 2013. That's the emergence of South Africa, uh, not just as a significant African uh, destination for clean energy investment, but a significant global destination for clean energy investment. The, uh, the, the, the dark blue, um, which is kind of the next biggest, I guess, um, is Kenya. And that's very much based in, in geothermal investment. Um, so Kenya is, is the African country that um, had, had most investments of over $4 billion in geothermal. And then we can see Ethiopia with the, the bright red um, sort of patchy record and, and again very much around um, the country, uh, sorry, the, the government itself directing um, what kinds of investments it's seeking, um, a lot of that being publicly financed. And I should also just add that what we mean by investment here um, covers the different asset classes from, from asset finance, so investments in a project, whether that's debt or equity, um, public market investment, venture capital, private equity, um, corporate and government uh, R&D, um, and also mergers and acquisitions. Now, we haven't seen very much of those latter types. Uh, most, of this, most of these dollars here are in um, asset finance. In, in projects themselves. Um, but we have seen some M&A some activity. So for instance, in 2012, um, there was quite a large acquisition um, of, a, of a geothermal project in Kenya, um, which, which uh, pushed up that amount for Kenya and for, and for geothermal. Uh, next slide, please. 
So if we look at this, essentially the same chart, but just uh, extrapolating by, by sector rather than country, um, you can see that prior to 2012, uh, quite a diverse mix, but solar really wasn't in there at all. Um, and we really haven't seen very much utility scale solar investment um, in Africa yet. Um, I, I think this is somewhat surprising, actually, because um, especially over the last couple of years, there's, there have been so many headlines about um, giant solar projects um, being developed in different countries. Um, and actually, in terms of um, dollars invested and megawatts built, uh, that remains very low. Uh, the big change has been with South Africa's auction program. So most of most of the uh, billions of dollars invested in South Africa has been in solar, um, and actually specifically solar thermal, which we'll, we'll see more of shortly. Um, so you can see also that geothermal has been a, a, an important factor for the region, and very much that being about Kenya. Um, we expect to see um, this, the same kind of trends continue for 2014. Um, there have been some, some sizable deals concluded in 2014. Um, particularly notable one was the Lake Takana project in Kenya. Um, so that kind of adds to the, uh, the wind category. Uh, if we could have the next slide, please. So this shows South Africa. Um, actually, I, I, I'm, I have to apologize. I, I spotted that 3.5 is a typo. That should be 4.5. Um, so apologies for that. Um, so again, I mean, th this is showing that there was really insignificant levels of clean energy investment in South Africa until 2012, until the start of the uh, Renewable Energy and Independent Power Producer Auction Program. Um, and now uh, that's over $10 billion in the last two years. Now, if, if we could have the next slide, please. We one of the extraordinary things about the South African auctions is the size of the solar thermal projects that have been commissioned. Um, and that's really a government decision uh, based on what they're willing to contract. Um, so a $1.2 billion solar thermal plant uh, financed last year. Um, again, I mean, that's, that's an ESCOM project, essentially. So um, ESCOM is, is not in uh, good financial health. Um, so, you know, particularly interesting to see um, a, a solar thermal plant of that magnitude coming through. Um, but likewise with uh, other project developers. Um, and if we could have the next slide. This is starting from a very low base for South Africa. So of South Africa's 43, 43.5 gigawatt total capacity, 87% um, coal. Now, South Africa's coal capacity alone is the same as the entire capacity of the rest of Sub-Saharan Africa. Um, there's an awful lot there. And we can see that clean energy so far, the build-out is sort of less than 1%. Um, with the capacity that's been contracted through the auction programs, we're forecasting that the clean energy capacity rises to around 8% by 2016. So in other words, quite, quite a big shift quite quickly, um, but starting from a very low base. Uh, next slide, please. And then this is just a look at the, the, the next uh, largest uh, clean energy market for the climate scope African countries and, and Kenya here. Now, Kenya is an interesting case because it's had a feeding tariff for, for several years um, and is indeed sort of putting renewed emphasis on the feeding tariff. Um, but actually, a lot of the investment has occurred um, slightly outside it. I mean, it's been, it's been a kind of stop-start process. Um, and again, very much around those large geothermal projects. If we could have the next slide, please. So outside of investment, um, this shows the clean energy policies that we, we found among the Climate Scope African countries. Um, all of these policies, individual policies, are in the Climate Scope Policy Library. I think one of the first things you can notice is that tax incentives are widespread. 
So we tend to see um, some kind of tax incentives for clean energy being part of wider tax incentives for investment in a lot of these countries. It's, it's really a different question, um, the extent to which they work in practice. So one of the things that we encountered was uh, several project developers, when, when our researchers went out and talked to project developers in these countries, several project developers who'd found it um, very difficult to negotiate actually, say, getting products in, um, into the country um, that were supposed to benefit from particular um, tax breaks or, or other incentives. Um, and and so, so not necessarily being implemented in practice, um, and, and certainly not necessarily transparently or, or straightforwardly. Uh, the next most common policy type are energy targets. Um, so most countries have some kind of specifically clean energy related target, um, often capacity target, but also percentage target. Um, again, these, these vary quite wildly um, in terms of uh, whether they're being used to base uh, wi wider reforms and, and other incentive programs on. So, for instance, um, for instance, in Liberia, um, you know, the, 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 the target uh, is, is one for 2015, um, and and is not one that has really been related to to other policy efforts. Finally, uh, the the next most common policy type are debt and equity incentives. So this is really around uh, grant programs and, and soft loans provided by the government, uh, perhaps through development partners. Um, a lot of the, the debt and equity incentives that we found were related to rural electrification. Um, and, and again, there was a kind of wide uh, diversity of programs that were uh, you know, were actually implemented and, and money actually being spent on the ground. Conversely, we found that those countries that had feed-in tariffs and auctions, so specific incentives designed to contract um, new clean energy capacity, um, by and large, once those programs are in place, um, they, you know, they're, they're very much sort of uh, capable of mobilizing investment. Um, so obviously we have Kenya, we have South Africa. Um, Nigeria is a bit of an exception. Um, feed and tariff is, is in force and is available, um, but is, does not seem to have been um, successful in, in attracting um, actual investment. And I think that's largely around the uncertainty of um, its uh, very recent and very extensive uh, liberalization program. A um, couple, of, couple of, sort of very interesting ones. Um, in Ghana and in Uganda, um, both have been incredibly successful at mobilizing interest in solar capacity. So Ghana through its feed-in tariff and Uganda through an addition to its feed-in tariff, a kind of top-up um, top tariff um, on top of the existing feed-in tariff, if, if that makes sense. Um, which was auctioned. And I think um, in Ghana, there was something like two gigawatts of, of interest expressed in um, around 150 megawatts of solar capacity the government actually wanted to contract through FIT, but it, it, you know, its, it's grid and its budgets could handle. Um, and in Uganda, I think it was around a gigawatt of interest for um, only 20 megawatts uh, of offered capacity. If we could have the next slide, please. So outside of the policy incentives, uh, we also, as I mentioned, looked at the, the structure of the power sector. And I guess the best way to think about this is um, a measure of liberalization. So for instance, we looked at the, the extent of unbundling. Um, we looked at the extent of private ownership. Um, we looked at distortions to retail electricity prices. Um, all of those different indicators you can see in the methodology um, available on the website. Um, and one of, the, one of the very interesting things here, I mean, you can immediately see that Nigeria is the, country, the African country that scores most highly um, in terms of the, the power sector, power sector score. Um, and it's a country that has 
been able to mobilize so far pretty much zero investment in clean energy. Now that may change and, and it is very much around um, how the reforms last year and, and over the last couple of years um, shape up. Uh, but then on conversely you have Ethiopia um, which is sort of down um, around a 0.5 score um, and again that being a very much state controlled uh, power sector. Um, yes, opening up a little to private investment, but and and there were sort of um, a couple of reforms around um, around contracting um, services out to um, consultants to improve service delivery. But I, I don't think there's any indication that the Ethiopian government fundamentally wants to restructure the power sector. So I think this begs some very interesting questions around the kind of policy reforms. Um, that are required to mobilize investment in clean energy. Next slide, please. So this is a, a high-level view of, of how the countries performed on the distributed energy and energy access scores. And the first thing um, is that Tanzania was the standout performer. Um, and this was particularly on the, the regulatory frameworks, small projects and mini grid. Um, this is really a, a, a case of um, a country that has put a lot of effort into getting the rules right. Um, so I think that process has been um, dated back to 2008. Um, it's involved working alongside, I think, the World Bank in particular, um, and it's it's an ongoing process. So. Uh, the, the, the standardized power purchase agreement may well be rolled into a kind of wider feeding tariff, um, but the point is that this has been very successful in, um, in mobilizing new projects and investors, so that Tanzania now has a pipeline of around 60 projects of under 10 megawatts, by no means uh, just clean energy, and I think majority non-clean energy, um, but nonetheless those, those rules in place being able to um, get projects of a, of a smaller scale um, in, and in a distributed sense. Um, on the energy access side, we generally saw much higher scores. So I think every country had a rural electrification agency. Um, and I think almost every country had a, a formal plan related to increasing energy access. We could go to the next slide, please. So I just wanted to finish by by looking ahead to uh, what what we're doing with Climate Scope, and Climate Scope is repeating for 2015. The the aim is very much to um, continue collecting the most recent data, but also building a track record of how these countries' performances change over time. And that's something that's certainly been very interesting for the Latin American countries that now have three years worth of data. Um, so we will be repeating the process for the countries that I've been talking about today. Uh, we're also actively interested in expanding to, to further countries and talking to, to various potential further partners. Um, so we're, we're very uh, grateful to our supporters so far and, and um, looking to expand, so please get in touch uh, if that's something of interest. Or um, We're also very much looking for feedback. Um, the aim of Climate Scope is to be a useful tool that provides data to a whole range of stakeholders um, to be practically useful. So, so please do get in touch um, if you have any comments on our approach. Um, we're also having uh, quite an in-depth session next month um, to, to kind of look at our methodology and see how we can refine it. Um, so that would be very helpful to hear from you. Um, and also just how, how you're using this tool and how it can be more useful. Um, so next slide, please. This is my email. Um, yes, please, please email, and I'd be very happy to take any questions. Thank you again for your attention, and thanks again to the Clean Energy Solutions Centre. Great, thank you very much, Nico, for the the presentation, and Maria as well. Um, we'll move along now to the question and answer session. And just a reminder to the audience, if you do have any questions, uh, you can submit those through the question pane. Um, so I'll go back to the first questions we received, and we'll work our way through those. 
Um, and one of the first questions, Nico, is it asked if there was a way to change the weightings of the individual criteria within the four parameters, or can we uh, change only the weightings of the four parameters? Um, that's not currently a feature on the website. Um, so that's something that we obviously um, can do in, in our own model, um, but is not currently a, a, a user feature. All right, thank you. And uh, what are what do you see as, and what do the reports show, the important detri uh, determinants of scaling up clean energy technologies among emerging countries? Oh, it's a great question. <laughs> I mean, I, I, I think there's a very clear indication from the results we see that um, while, while the economics are becoming more and more attractive, um, there's a place for very specific policy incentives. Um, so you can look at Brazil, um, so an auction program that is, is delivering the lowest cost clean energy um, that we've seen in the world. Um, likewise, South Africa. Um, China is a market that's uh, very much reliant on, on different policies um, from feed and tariffs to um, low-cost financing. Um, so, so I think there, there's a strong case for, for those kind of um, specific schemes. And that's I, I, the other thing that I think is very interesting about that for emerging markets is that there's an opportunity there to, um, to, to, to leapfrog what has already been tried out in, in Europe. Um, so for instance, the idea of um, going for fixed fees and tariffs rather than those that um, are either competitively allocated um, at the lowest cost um, or that relate in some way to an existing power market. Um, those are all things that have been tried out and mistakes have been made in, in especially the European countries that first introduced these. And now there's, there's a really good body of evidence over, over what works. Great. Thanks again, Nico. Uh, and next question. Um, Want to know if, if what your insights or if the Climate Scope report had any insights on the level of interest in financing the complete process, and what the, the attendee meant by that is, um, you know, uh, technologies that have not yet been commercially proven. So basically, starting from the very beginning and financing the process all the way through. Uh, that, uh, that's a very interesting question. I, I think in general, um, I'm cer certainly related to the African countries that I've spent most time looking at, um, we don't see so much of that kind of investment. Um, there, there, there are kind of isolated uh, companies in, in different African countries. I'm thinking of a, a very advanced electronics company in Ethiopia um, as one that has attracted some venture capital funding. Um, by and large, I mean, we, we, we have pretty good insight into that from the kind of financing flows. So um, VC and, and private equity into, into earlier stage technologies. And I think generally what we've seen, um, it, certainly in Africa, is, is less of that kind of finance. Um, so it being much more project based. Um, now, we don't, as far as climate scope goes, I, I think the focus is, does any way stay more on the project level? So we're talking more about capacity build out because the, the way the model is structured is around, um, is around that kind of investment. And, and policy wise likewise. So um, we, we don't look particularly in depth into say research programs that are sponsored by government. Great. And uh, Nico, getting back to the Climate Scope report, uh, how did you go about assigning weights while calculating the index among parameters? So for, for the overall weightings, um, that was that that was really a decision um, taken by the steering committee. So between um, us at Bloomberg New Energy Finance and, and our partners and the UK and US governments and the Inter American Development Bank. Um, it's a tricky issue. I mean, it is, it, it, it's a, it is a kind of arbitrary decision, and it changes the way that these countries line up. 
Um, so we did actually this year um, change the weighting. Um, it was previously for the Latin American nations, 40% um, for the enabling framework, 30% for investment, 20% for um, the value chains, and 10% for carbon. Um, and we actually leveled the value chains and the carbon 15% each. Um, and I, I think that conversation from memory um, was, you know, at least an hour long debate. Um, but but in a very interesting one because it, it, it I, I guess the, the subject matter is, um, you know, what do we think is important in terms of the conditions for attracting further investment? On the other hand, while, while it's somewhat arbitrary, um, I, I guess it's also um, one that that can be played with easily. Um, so the idea is not to say this is what we think is important. Um, the idea is is just to be able to present the data in a certain way that uh, that can be used. Great. And um, could you elaborate more on the debt equity incentives? And how do the debt equity incentives differ from the carbon market? Sure. Uh, so debt and equity incentives, I mean, we're really talking about any, um, any money being put up um, that doesn't come from a, uh, a specific incentive program like a feed and tariff. So it's not going to be a generation-based payment for output. Um, this covers really a wide range of um, grants, soft loans, um, and differs from the carbon market mechanisms in that um, the carbon market mechanisms would be things like um, a carbon tax, um, an emissions trading system, um, and then the, the, the credits that you can generate from carbon markets as well. Great, and uh, Nico, a, a bit of a broader question, but what are your recommendations for the practical use of the elements hi uh, highlighted by the Climate Scope Report? Great question. Um, the first and foremost uh, thing that we, we hope to achieve with Climate Scope is, is getting a conversation going. So we've, we've had uh, some very interesting follow-ups over the last couple of, couple of years from the Latin American region. Um, where uh, countries have, have or governments rather, have been very interested in, in where they finish on climate scope and why. Um, and that's really been a platform for, for workshops, bringing together policymakers and investors um, the, and project developers as well. So, for instance, we've, we've held workshops in Nicaragua at the request of the government and, and sort of informed those processes. Um, this is for us. This is a you know a fantastic outcome, and, and we hope that the, um, the the wider climate scope 2014 can be used in similar ways. Um, then, kind of going a bit deeper into um, the data that's provided, uh, the aim is for this uh, for climate scope to be a data resource that currently doesn't exist. So, rather than um, those investors who um, are interested in finding out what a power price is in, in Liberia, um, having to trawl the internet and kind of figure out which uh, data resources to go to. Uh, we, we really want Climate Scope to be a, a, a place where you can just go and find that very easily. And uh, you can know that, that that data point has been you know, carefully collected um, through a research trip and through the most up-to-date uh, data sources out there. Um, the third way is that we we really want policymakers to be able to engage um, on both the policy front, so so looking at what kind of policies seem to be working, um, looking at what policies uh, neighbouring countries have and and the kind of effects those those have, but also uh, being able to take something of an investor perspective from climate scope. Um, I think the way that climate scope presents a lot of data. Um, is 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 one where um, sort of those more vested in in in, in policy can sort of uh, understand a bit more about the perspective of investors and and uh, low carbon businesses. Great, and 
uh, you mentioned that the African countries are scoring well on energy access in terms of having plans in place. Uh, how are they doing as far as implementing those plans, and what areas in general are they weakest in? Um, great question. I, I'd say we, we don't have particularly comprehensive data on implementation. Um, and I think that relates to one of the areas we found most challenging was, and, and perhaps this also relates to um, where, where, where there's kind of weaknesses, is in um, once a program's established, um, the reporting on, on how that's doing. Um, so, for instance, where we wanted to find out um, there's, there's a particular program around the distribution of solar home systems or this kind of thing, um, we found it very difficult to, to actually find out how well that was doing. Um, there, are, there are sort of notable exceptions, I guess. I mean, I, I mentioned Rwanda. I think Rwanda um, seems to be a country where a very ambitious electrification plan has been established and seems to be in motion. Good. And the, the last question I received so far, Nico, asks um, if a country is interested in being included in the study, uh, how should they go about expressing their interest? Should they email you? Yes, please. Uh, that would be great to hear. Um, our only limitation uh, is in terms of, of support. So there's no reason that we chose to exclude any country. Um, and we'd be delighted to expand this research further. Great. So uh, in regards to that question, uh, Nico's email address is still displayed on that slide. So if there are any countries that are interested, um, go ahead and email him there. And that is the last question I've received. Um, so now I'd just like to, before we wrap up, move on to the a quick survey we have for the attendees. And so uh, Heather, if you could go ahead and display that first question for us. And the question is, the webinar content provided me with useful information and insight. Great. And the next question, please. The webinar's presenters were effective. And the final question is, overall, the webinar met my expectations. Oh, oh there we go. Sorry, that final question is, overall, the webinar met my expectations. Great. Thank you for answering our survey. Um, and on behalf of the Clean Energy Solutions Center, I would just like again to thank Nico and Maria and also our attendees for participating in today's webinar. Uh, we very much appreciate everyone's time. And I do invite the attendees to check the Solutions Center website if you would like to view today's slides and listen to a recording of today's presentations, as well as any previously held webinars. Uh, just a reminder, give us about a week to get the recording of the uh, webinar up on the site. Additionally, on there you can find information on upcoming webinars and other training events. And also a reminder, we are now posting all of our webinar recordings to the Clean Energy Solutions Center YouTube channel, where you can also find other videos up there. Uh, we also invite you to inform your colleagues and those in your networks about Solutions Center resources and services, including the no-cost Ask an Expert policy support. And so with that, I hope everyone has a great rest of your day, and we hope to see you again at future Clean Energy Solutions Center events. And this concludes our webinar.